All right, let's get started. Look, we'll filter in as, as uh, class starts. So the last time, it was a few weeks ago now, so I'll maybe start a little bit before where we left off last time. Um, we're finishing up the final unit of our course now, which is on control. And we've gone through a couple different methods of controlling systems. So we started with uh, PID control, right, but kind of built that incrementally in terms of first looking at the P part, which measures deviation from the absolute target we're looking for, then the D part, which measures deviation from the derivatives to kind of slow things down, um, and the integrator part, which will maybe take into account that we don't know the steady state uh, feed forward terms that we want. Um, but then we kind of shifted gears a little bit and talked about LQR control instead. And LQR control is different in that we're returning to this optimal control paradigm. Right? With PID control, we basically just pick some targets that we want, and then we pick numbers, gains, that we think might get us there. Right? And that can be kind of tricky sometimes to pick the right ones, to know which are going to be, in fact, the right gains to pick to get us there as, as uh, optimally as possible. And so LQR provides us a more formal way of specifying what our costs are, what we really want to optimize in our setting here. And then given those costs and the model, it's important that we have to know the model of the system to apply this. But if we know this model, then LQR provides a way to convert from this. Oops. Uh, let me just hang on. Right, so LQR provides a way to convert from this to a controller, a control law, right? And what we said, though we didn't really prove this, was that the controller in LQR was very nice in that it had this special form where it would give us actions ut as some function, some matrix k, times our current state. Remember, this is for a control cost that penalizes us um, deviating from 0 in the x's and deviating from 0 in the u's. So, this, so the idea here is that we have a linear system, not an affine system. A linear system, that means that if x is 0 and u is 0, we stay in the 0 state. So 0 is kind of the goal of this system, right? We want to drive this to 0, regulate it around 0. And LQR says that the optimal controller is of this form. We pick u according to this. Now there's actually one, and actually I still should have added here, in the previous formulation, we would always would also say that x1 is equal to some fixed initial state, right? Because we start in some state x1. I should probably add that as a constraint here. Um, but one interesting thing about LQR is that the actual control that we get does not depend on the initial state of our system. It's kind of this really interesting thing where we start in some state, we want to solve some optimization problem, right? But the solution to it is actually I mean, of course, you know, depending on what that first state is, we'll pick some control. But this form of the solution is actually independent of what our first state is. So LQR in some sense, and the point I want to make today is that, at the beginning at least, is that LQR in some sense bridges the gap between this kind of PID type control, which is thought of as feedback control, since we have, you know, observe our state and then pick control actions based on that. It results in a controller that is very much of this form, this feedback type form, but it is actually solving an optimization problem. So this is kind of a bridge between the PD control that we started with, which is kind of maybe the first type of control you might see if you get class on control, and this more powerful paradigm for optimal control. And um, I also mentioned we can actually solve an infinite time problem here, right? Where actually, instead of just summing from t equals 1 to some big horizon, we actually sum over all an infinite horizon. And the idea again here is that if we can get the state to 0 in some finite amount of time, this whole thing will be finite, because then after that it'll just be 0 from then on. And so actually this ends up being 
uh, solvable much in the same way that the finite time horizon, or sorry, finite horizon problem is. Again, I'm not going to get into this, and I'm not going to write the exact form for that k. Uh, it does take a little bit of, of algebra to, to get it. It's just linear algebra, so it's just inversions and major multiplications. That's all that's involved in it. But it is a little bit complex, too. So I didn't want to spend too much time in the details there, because they're somewhat we're going to quickly move on to optimization-based approaches. And the actual details of this one approach are, in some sense, incidental, uh, though it is very good. If you, have, if you have the opportunity to take another class on this, to go through this in more detail as well. And in fact, uh, part of the reason why, why I just leave it at this is that there is in fact a MATLAB command that will give you this, for the infinite time case, will give you this gain, these gains k. Just it's the DLQR function, it stands for discrete time LQR. And so with one line of MATLAB, you can actually solve this optimization problem right here. And very, very quickly. I mean, th th this will solve it in milliseconds. So. Nice to look at that. Now, the example that we're going to look at, and I described a little bit the derivation of this. Everyone kind of remember how we derived this. It's kind of complex, right? But we basically we had some uh, generator dynamics, and we also had some power flow constraints, which we approximated in our DC power flow setting, and then we ended up with some expression here that related how the actual angles, voltage angles, the different generators actually affected the evolution of the, the dynamics of each generator's um, angular velocity, actually. And this, uh, these terms here actually would couple together all the generators. So it was now a, a big coupled system that all worked together. In the case of PID control, we essentially just said we're going to ignore that. We're going to say we don't care about that. Um, but here we're going to say, OK, let's actually look at what we can do in this LQR sense, this kind of more optimal sense, to actually account for the fact that there are these cross correlations here. Um, and so we, what we did was then we just wrote it as a linear system. And the point I want to make through all of this, and it's a little bit of math here, but, but the point I want to make through all of this, and I, I, didn't, I covered it very quickly last time, so I'm going to go through it in detail now, is that the ultimate form of LQR that you get out of an LQR controller looks very similar to what you get out of a PD or PID controller for this same task. And that's really the only point I'm making here, but I just want to go through it in some detail about why this is the case. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to convert this to a discrete time system. Right? I, was, I was sort of for convenience, it's sometimes easier here to talk about continuous time systems because dynamics, like first order differential equations, kind of describe the system. It's easier to talk about um, these, these differential equations. But in our case, we're going to really think about control in terms of uh, discrete time, in terms of making a finite number of actions here. And so I'll talk about converting to a discrete time system here. And we do this just by order integration, remember. Uh, we just take these, the next state equals the current state plus delta t times axt, which is the derivative of xt, and then plus delta t times b and then plus some extra term. Remember, this is, this is actually an affine system because if we don't put any control input, the system won't stay in its desired location. It'll actually uh, slow down to be 0 right? So now the point I want to make is that <clears throat> this is a little bit different from our normal LQR task, right? We have this extra term here. You know, maybe it's a little unclear exactly what we do in that case because, you know, oops, this should be a UT. I apologize there. Oh, I guess these changes didn't go through on this slide. Anyway, sorry about that. It should be a UT here, and it should also be a B tilde. Um, but the point is that even though this is not a system where zero state and zero control gives you zero next state, you can still apply LQR by actually finding what's called an equilibrium point of this system. So the idea is we find some point. And this is our desired point, really, right? So say we want to maintain the system at the, the point x star, right? And this would be a point x star, where x star equals a tilde x star plus b tilde u star plus a. So x and x star and u star are an equilibrium point of this system, right? 
And in this case, all it is is that x is our desired, in this case, uh, voltage angles and frequency. Namely, the frequencies are all the same. They're all the reference frequency. And the voltage angles are the desired voltage angles. That's x star. So let me just write it out. So x star equals theta desired and then omega reference. Okay. Now the question is, what control, remember this is an affine system now, we're adding some extra term here, what control do we actually apply in order to get this to stay here? Um, and this, remember, was just our, our feed forward control essentially, right? <clears throat> when we talked about the first bit of, of PID control, <clears throat> PD control, we needed this kind of extra term, right? We needed to apply some power in order to make these all work. And so, by the notation before, U star, I think we were calling this P elect, right? Where P elect was, in fact, the power that we would need to maintain these angles here. And you can compute that just from um, DC power flow, right? Remember that our DC power flow approximation is that P equals B of theta. So, we can actually compute what P elect is just by plugging this into this expression here. And so, this gives us an equilibrium point of the system because we know that x star equals, um, if, if we are in this desired state, we apply our you know, nominal control input here, then we will end up in our desired state the next time too. Right? So the only point I want to make here is that you can use something like this to convert an affine system to actually a linear system. It's a little bit different. So we're actually going to say now, we're going to define delta xt to be equal to xt minus x star. And we're going to define delta ut to be equal to ut minus ut star. And now my claim is that in these new variables, which are kind of, remember, our original variables, LQR, you think about it in terms of regulating things to zero, right? You want to make your variables zero because things stay there. Um, we don't want to make these variables zero because that would mean we're not spinning at all. Uh, that would be a bad thing. We want to make them these things. So it's better to think about our variables in terms of the difference from the desired state, right? We're just transforming it to this different state sort of representation. And my claim is that in this representation, we have actually a linear system, xt plus delta xt plus 1 equals a tilde delta xt plus b tilde delta ut. Right? And these are in fact the exact same a tilde and b tilde here. So this is an LQR system now that's purely linear that we're using just with this new representation here. And the way to see this also, by the way, is that this just falls out very, very quickly. So basically what this says is that this is, by plugging these definitions here, this is xt plus 1 minus x star equals a tilde xt minus x star plus b tilde ut uh, minus u star. Right, and um, actually, shoot, did I miss an A there? No, I didn't. This is okay. So we know that this thing holds here, right? And we know that xt. We also know that xt plus one. Let me actually let me try it like this. Okay, xt plus one equals a tilde xt plus b tilde ut plus a, right? We know that. We know that this thing holds here. So x star equals a tilde x star plus b tilde u star plus a. And if we just subtract this one from this one, we get this equation here. Right? 
the a's cancel out here, and what we're left with is u, u minus u star times b tilde, x t minus x star, and then x t plus 1 minus x. So we did this to basically get rid of this affine term here and think about it in terms of a purely linear, a purely linear system. Now, and I'll just erase that because it's sort of unimportant here. But the, um, the point is that if we now run LQR with this cost on our delta t's, we're doing everything in this delta t state, right? Now, which is really just our state minus the desired state. That's kind of what we want to control on. What we get is we get a control law of the form delta ut, the difference between our control and our desired, or sorry, our, our nominal control here, is equal to k delta xt. And put another way, all this is saying is that ut equals, well, u star plus k times x t minus x star. So now in the language of what we saw before in terms of our control laws, this term here is just our feed forward control, right? Feed forward. And this term here is basically just our P and D terms. Because X, remember, has both the desired angles and their velocities. So this term here, the, the, the big X here, includes both a proportional term and a derivative term. And in fact, we can write the exact, so remember, our control law is of this form, x ut equals u star plus this thing. And in contrast, our PD controller, and this is PD, this is not PID, this is actually PD with the true feed forward gain. So suppose we actually knew this ahead of time, right, the P elect, and we're just going to do that plus some gains here. PD, if you look back to the previous slides, and when them write this is actually in matrix notation, what you'll find is that it's actually the exact same form of control law here. You say that you give your control, you give the control equal to your nominal feed forward controller, plus, well, some p gains times how much you deviate from your desired state, right? And that would be the first, uh, you know, n elements of this vector here, just times your kp gain. And then also, um, your, how much you differ from your desired velocity. In this case, it would be how much you're differing from your desired reference velocity times your d gains here. So this thing is the exact same form as what we get from LQR. The difference is that the normal PD controller, these are diagonal matrices, right? So you just, for picking the ith control, you just look at the ith bus. You look at its how much is deviating from its desired angle, and how much it deviates from its desired velocity, and you make a control based on that. In contrast, the, the LQR controller, in general, this K matrix will be a full matrix, and typically will be for most costs. And what's happening there is what you're doing is you're actually looking not only at your own state to determine what to do, you're looking at other states as well, right? Because we know that in the true system, these things are coupled, right? The actual voltage angle at other buses affects how your dynamics evolve. And so to really control this optimally in some sense, we have to take that into account. And we have to actually base our control inputs on the state of other generators. And the LQR system here captures that in an, in an optimal way. The other thing is that in addition to sort of accounting for this nice correlation between different buses, LQR still has this advantage of being oftentimes much more intuitive to specify. Right? It's much more sort of clear to say I just don't want 
these things to differ very much from their desired state, and maybe I even want to give this relative weighting to how much I care about some states versus how much I care about other states. That's pretty intuitive, right? You, you sort of know what's happening when you specify a cost function like that. Versus trying to specify gains in this matrix itself would be very tricky to do, right? I mean, it's hard even for the PD case sometimes. It'd be even harder to think about, well, you know, how should I adjust my control on the first generator based on you know, how much the fifth generator is off in the system. Yeah? Uh, isn't there kind of a practical solution with having a full K matrix because you're like changing different generators simultaneously? Right, so, so the, the, this, this sort of assumes that there either is a single step to the dynamics, like there is an actual discrete time system, right, where all of them change kind of simultaneously based on the control that they all pick. Now, you can also it isn't too hard to show that even when you make slightly asynchronous updates in this case, things are still okay, things still remain stable. Um, but yes, in reality, you sort of each one might be operating at its own different time scale. You might be getting estimates of the states that are a little bit off. These aren't that big a problem in practice in some cases. So they, they can actually be problems if these delays get big enough and you have sort of enough unknowns in the system. These can become issues. Um, here, though, we're going to assume the discrete time systems. We're assuming things can just kind of march along in step and that. You pick a control for everyone simultaneously, and they all get the next state. Um, and that's not a bad approximation as long as you're updating things fast enough. Uh, this is a reasonable approximation. I mean, in reality, th these are differential equations. So even the discrete time approximation is wrong. Um, but they still can be, can be fine to do in practice. <coughs> OK, so there any, were there any questions on this? Yeah. Yeah, so that's what you that's what you have to pick. Um, just as with so so you can't I mean you can't do nothing you can't specify nothing right you can't say just do well right it needs to know what do well means, um, and in this case what doing well means is minimizing some cost function specified like this, and what it basically says is th oh, so 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 for example think of Q here as being diagonal, and usually actually almost always in practice you set up a diagonal one because they're much easier to specify. So let's just make Q be diagonal here. Uh, in fact, make it even be a constant diagonal term. What that says is, and R is a different constant diagonal term, but possibly with different. Um, different from Q, that is. So what that says is, there's some cost to being far away from my desired state. Maybe you want to have a different one, actually, for the two components. So you have one constant for how much you want to be different from uh, theta d and one constant for how much we have from, from, from omega ref. Um, so what this is saying is there's some cost that I incur when I'm far away from those things. And it's a quadratic cost, so the farther I am, the, the worse and worse this cost is. Um, what's actually more important than the absolute num value of this cost is the relative values of the different costs, right? In fact, all that really matters is the relative values. You, don't, doesn't, you, you could scale them all by a constant and it wouldn't affect things at all. But if you make R much smaller than Q, what it would say is being far away from my desired state is much worse than using a lot of control. Right? I can put in a whole lot of different control, you know, a whole lot of, of power, put in a whole lot more power or less power into my generators, that's fine. What's really bad here is deviating from my desired state. Whereas vice versa, if this was small compared to this, then it would say, I really don't want to deviate very much from my desired input, and I, don't, I care less about getting to my desired state, maybe getting there quickly. Remember, once we're there, we're going to stay there still. But if this is much bigger than that, then we'll take slower to get there, but we'll use less control to do it. If this is very much bigger than that, we'll get to our desired state very quickly, but we'll use really high control to get there. So what's important to think of here is the relative weightings of these different cost functions. And that determines how your controller is going to actually act. I don't have the slides this time, but, but just like with uh, PD control, where we varied the gains and saw different things happening, if you vary costs here, you will see different behavior from your algorithm. Or from the controller, rather. 
so here's what it looks like. Uh, and, and don't read too much into these precise graphs here because they're just one example for one such cost function. Um, but essentially we have our generators, we have, they start off at some angles which, which are not their desired uh, voltage angles, and then they pretty quickly converge to that. And one thing you'll notice here is that there isn't that much kind of ringing back and forth, right? They kind of all just kind of pretty smoothly go there. One nice thing about LQR is that typically when you have, when you know the true model, um, it will typically pick controllers that don't have this oscillation. It will actually smooth things kind of very nicely. And that's just because oftentimes oscillation, and not always, um, this does not always happen, but oftentimes oscillations actually give you higher costs, right? Because if you're overshooting back and forth, that's kind of silly. Um, you think that would give you higher costs. And so oftentimes uh, LQR for a wide variety of costs actually will give you these very nice smooth control laws that, that very quickly get you to uh, the desired state without too much oscillation. Again, that's not always true, but it's just a, a rule of thumb is that in general, for a known system, picking gains for PD control makes it much easier to oscillate rather than um, running something like LQR. And this shows then um, the, the, how the angles evolve. So you know, we start off at something that is not our desired angles. They all converge to it. And similarly, we actually start off at um, everything being at the reference frequency. But then because we have to change things in order to get these to their desired angles, we deviate away from it first, but then come back to it. And this is all pretty quickly, too. So the problem, though, is that while this is sort of a, these are nice graphs here, and they look, they look very nice. Um, the tricky part is that I'm, I'm, they're meant to illustrate what LQR looks like, and they're not actually that realistic for the following reason. Um, the actual power we need to achieve these things, so remember, U here is the, con is the power that each node generates. That is the um, nominal power from the system, which, which also includes loads, by the way, so these things can be negative. Um, but it includes the power from, you know, at each bus plus whatever extra we want to put into it in order to generate more power, say. Right? And unfortunately, um, <laughs> if we just look at kind of how much power these things actually say to produce to achieve this kind of effect here, um, they're actually quite big. So here, you know, the, the, the nominal powers, these, these converge to their nominal powers, which are in their order of, these are all, this is a powerful problem, so they're all in this kind of PU unit. So this is all, I think you, you would scale it by like 100 megawatts if you want to know the actual power. Um, but in terms of these per unit designations, they're all in the kind of this range here, uh, the different things. Some are positive, some are negative because they have loads coming out of them, some have just generators. Um, but the control that you actually need, the power you need to put into these, the generator, this is how much you push on those cranks on each, uh, or I guess you also you know, pull on the cranks too if you want to have negative power or just consume power at, at, at a node. Um, these are actually quite large compared to the nominal range of these things, right? So this is not very realistic. Essentially it's saying that, look, at first you have to actually consume a whole lot of power at each of these nodes. That essentially slows down some of the generators to let their phase angles uh, fall a little bit, sorry, that their, their voltage angles fall a little bit, and then that lets them you know, re reach the desired ones. But this is pretty extreme here. You know, we're, we're at negative eight or so uh, units, and you know, the, these are all in the range of about one to two at the end. So this is, this is not very realistic. And again, this is sort of a problem with LQR, right? Because it's prescribing this type of control law. And what that said, and I, should, I should also add, this is actually, by the way, this is similar to PD and PID controls, the ones I showed before. They're again, they're supposed to be illustrative, um, but they are not very realistic and that you actually need quite a lot of power to do this. Or the ability to change power very, very quickly. Um, so this is kind of a problem, right? Because PD or LQR, their control laws are of this form. And so what that means is, the farther you are away from your desired state, the more and more control you will want to apply. So if you're very far away from your desired state, 
that you're just starting up and you don't have any speed yet. You're starting up a new generator that isn't spinning yet. It would essentially say, you know, put in a huge, huge amount of power to get to that new state that you want to be at. Um, and that's not really feasible. You can't really do that. Right? You have to... There are limits to how much power a generator can produce. And you have to obey those things. So, what do we do in that case? And there are some heuristics you can use. I guess, I guess the fundamental problem is, with these things I've been talking about, a lot of classical control methods, like PD control, or like LQR, um, we can't really put hard constraints. I guess I'll talk about LQR. In the optimization formulation of LQR, we can't really just put hard constraints on the variables, right? Um, if we do, it no longer has an exact solution anymore. Or, sorry, it doesn't have an analytical solution like this K here. So we can't just say, oh, by the way, this generator, you can't produce more than 5 megawatts of power. It's actually not allowed in LQR. Now, there are some, some heuristics you can use to account for this. One thing you could do is just take this controller like this and just say, well, look, any U that's outside of my range, I'm just going to clip it to that maximum range. Right? I'm going to take what LQR says, but then I can't physically do it always, so I'll just take that and then clip things to their allowable range. That works sometimes. Okay. Um, but there isn't really much you can say about what it's really going to do. Another, another thing you can do, I should, I should add, is that you could also take these costs and just tune them just right so that you always sort of get the desired behavior. Maybe even have to use time varying costs. You can do that too, by the way, in LQR. You can have different Q and R matrices for different times. And you could tune those in a way that says, okay, well, look, if, if you apply too much control action, I'll just make that cost a little bit higher on the control to actually require that you apply less control next time. These are all doable, but there isn't very much you can say about them. This one's really kind of time consuming and a pain. This one, it actually does work okay sometimes, but it doesn't always work. It works really badly some other times too. Um, especially if you don't have as many control inputs as you have states that you want to control. Um, this can be really a tough, a tough thing to do. So, these are sort of all potential things you can do. Um, but the nicer thing, in some sense, is to return back to our original idea of control as optimization. So the nicer thing is just to say, well, look, LQR, we're going to go back, and this is sort of where we started from in some sense, but we kind of came on a little detour to talk about other types of control, like PD control and LQR control. But the, the fundamental point that I started out with when I talked about control was we can set up control like an optimization problem, right? This was the optimization problem that LQR was solving. It was solving some quadratic costs, some linear dynamics here, and then plus a constraint on the initial state. Now it turned out that there actually was no dependence on the initial state for the solution, or rather for that k feedback gains you get. Um, but, but still, it was solving optimi an optimization problem. <coughs> so, let's just take this problem. We know we can solve it, right? We, we, before we were solving it with some of this DLQR function, which we don't really know what it does, but it just magically solves this somehow. Let's instead just say, okay, look, this is a, I guess, quadratic program, right? Because it has quadratic terms here, linear constraints. That's the QP. And we know how to solve that. Furthermore, if we think of this as a QP, we can just put our constraints directly in the system. Right? If we have, say, some lower bound on U and some upper bound on U that says we can only apply a certain amount of control, well, we can just plug those right into the system as constraints. Everything else is the same, but now we're adding constraints. We can also put constraints on the state, by the way, too. If you have some 
system where you really cannot get the state in some bad location, you can't enforce that with LQR. Right? If, if a system will explode if the state ever goes above a certain amount, you know, LQR would say, okay, you know, my, I have a quantity that costs on that. Maybe it's kind of bad, but I don't want to use too much control action to get away from that. That's not a very realistic uh, scenario, right? Because you really have some states that you just cannot get into. You do not want to get into those ever. And so we could also say, for example, in this formulation, put absolute constraints on control on the states. Now, by the way, if we make this too stringent, and specify constraints on the states that we cannot achieve with the controls that we have, well, the problem will be infeasible. Right? It's possible for these problems to be infeasible, certainly. Um, but that actually tells us something interesting, too. Right? If we solve, try to solve the problem and it's, it's, it's unfeasible, we say, well, OK, something's wrong. We actually can't achieve the states we wanted to achieve with those controls. So we need to change something. Yeah? Absolutely, yeah. You could absolutely put a constraint on so all sorts of things, right? You could put a constraint on u t minus t minus one minus u t. You could make that between um, you, you know delta u bar upper and delta u lower. Which is actually a very important thing. In I think we have this in the homework. You actually have this constraint on one of your. I forget exactly. Depending on, it wasn't quite this because we actually one of the things is actually. One of the changes is captures the state variable, so I actually forget that. But um, yes, if, if, if you want to, you can certainly also, you, you won't, so what I'm saying is you want to do this for the homework, um, because actually the use just capture the change by themselves. Um, but if you want to say, OK, we can't change the amount of power we put in too much from one time to the next, which is actually very realistic, right? Because that's exactly what happens. A generator cannot go from, uh, full on to full off very quickly. Um, you can put constraints like this too on in your system. This is also a convex constraint, right? It's the linear inequality here. You can put this into your program. It still ends up being a quadratic program. You can do some other things too, right? You could do like, um, I don't want the state to change by too much over a different time span. I can put constraints in the state at some times and not others. I mean, in general, you can put any constraint of the form like this, right? A, I shouldn't use A there. Let's say G times X, I guess G times X U plus or equal to H. I mean, anything like that is, is doable. You could, for, if you wanted to, you could say that, okay, the 50th state can't be much more than this far away from the 20th. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you can do anything like that. So this is a much more powerful set of constraints we actually can capture in this framework here. Right? And no matter how many we put in, as long, again, as long as they're all convex, some things you can't constrain exactly, um, but as long as they're all convex, then this is a convex program and we can just plug it into YALMIP and solve it. Yeah? Uh, we don't have to use delta t and delta u, uh, delta x t and delta u. Um, so I'm writing it more just as a, as a conceptual idea here. In the case of our control task here, yes, you'd still want to use those. Um, I mean, and sometimes you don't have to quite in the same way because LQR required you actually had the system like this. Here, you can add plus a there. And that would actually be a perfectly valid system. It's an affine system now, but you don't have to worry about converting it to the right form before you put it in a form like this because it's already captured. Now, you probably also would want to adjust the um, cost here because you probably don't actually want to penalize costs from zero, right? That's probably not, you, you definitely want to have x minus xd here. You probably also want to have u minus u star, or x minus x star. You probably also want to have u minus u star here because you don't want to say that we would like to be at a time where we're putting in zero power. You actually would like to be putting in the nominal amount of power. Um, but yes, you can do all that in this framework, and you can do it without actually changing the changing the um, formulation here. You, you don't have to think of it in terms of delta t's. You can just put them directly in the cost function itself if you want to. 
um, because it is a little bit kind of intuitive to do it like that. And I think I actually have that example later on in the code that I have describing this thing. I'll show just putting them directly into the, into the cost function. So let's take this problem again, and now let's write it as an optimization problem. Okay? And it ends up being not too many lines of code here. So uh, I'm going to do it in YALMIP as we do everything. And what I do is I just set up a big optimization problem where my variables are these x's here. And I have t of them. t actually is 100,000, or 10,000 in this case. This thing is still really fast to solve. I think I have an n, this is the number of generators, and that's 5. So I have x, which includes my gener uh, voltage angles and angular velocities of each generator. So it's 2 times the number of generators. U is the number equal to the, uh, we have one for each generator, it's the amount of power we put in, and then one for each time t. Um, it's actually good, and when you're doing your own um, in the homework, it's good to treat these things as matrices in the optimization problem. It just makes it much easier. If you had to create, for example, a great big vector with all the x's stacked up, up on top of each other, um, the constraints here would be much nastier. Uh, you just have to sort of figure out exactly how to make a big matrix that relates them all. Um, but one thing that Yalmup is very good at is actually building up fairly complex constraints from matrices. So for example, and, and this is also without for loops. You, you actually don't need for loops to do all this. So for example, the constraint that the dynamics have to evolve according to this affine system would be, say, x all the rows and the two to the end columns equal a times x of one to the n minus one columns plus b times u from one to minus n columns plus a. Okay, and that is a single matrix equality here that captures the dynamics for all times t. Does that make sense to everyone? Sort of how that how that's working? Because you'll definitely want to do that on your own homework assignments. Uh, you don't want to write 4t equals 1 to 10,000, adding a new constraint each time. That'll get very cumbersome. Um, and you'll make YAMAP a lot slower. Yeah? Yeah, so I'm assuming these are already all defined. I mean, they're, they're, they're right from these things, right? They're, they're these things here. Um, I guess that, that they're actually delta t times these things here. But it's just... Yeah, that's a little bit more code then, but uh, once you define them, then I'm assuming you already wrote the code for LQR, I guess. I'm just writing the code for, uh, for the other one, for the optimization formulation. Okay, so this is that first constraint. The dynamics have to evolve according to this. Right? This next one says that what the initial state is. So x is the initial state is, well, all the, all the voltage angles are zero, but it, it, they're all spinning at the reference angular velocity. That's the initial state that I used in all the other cases as well, by the way. And then, let's also say now, u star here is just that, that nominal u star, u star vector here, um, and x star is going to be the x star one. So what I'm also going to say is that my controls can never go below 0.5 units times, or can never go 0.5 units below the nominal control. And they can never go any more than 0 0.5 units above the nominal control. So I'm keeping my control in a fairly tight band around those nominal amounts, right? This is much um, less than what LQR would normally prescribe. And then finally, what I do is I just solve the SDP with these constraints. I know I'm not constraining x here, and I'm not constraining uh, you know, deltas on the user or anything like that. Um, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to solve this SDP, where the objective is just the norm of x minus x star, and plus uh, 1 10 to the negative 3 times the norm of u minus u star. 
So these are my, actually my Q functions. Frobenius here just means a norm between matrices, just the two norm between different matrices. And that's really it. That's, that's the objective, right? I had this term here, that's my objective. Q is, so what would Q be? Q would be 1 and R would be, I guess, the square root of 10 to the negative 3. Um, and this just captures that thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That should be a big N. I guess, I guess they actually said the same thing in mind, but this should be a big N. Yeah, yeah. I changed that for this because I was notation here and they were the same in the map, map, my actual MATLAB code. What was the pro again? Um, the Frobenius norm, is, 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 it's notation for the Frobenius norm here. Uh, in MATLAB, if you have a matrix X, um, if you say norm, so if you, if you have a vector X, X is a vector. That's kind of ambiguous. This is a lowercase x, this is a big uppercase x. Um, yeah, let me, we have, we've had enough. We can write this here. So for a vector, norm of x, in fact, I guess norm of x squared to the caret. So this in MATLAB would be equal to the sum over all i from 1 to n, xi squared, right? And you don't have to, have to put anything after that. But if you put like norm 2, it'll be the same thing there. For matrices, if x is a matrix, this no longer is the right thing anymore. It is not equal to the sum over all i and j of x i j squared. Um, it's actually slightly, slightly different. We won't worry about what it actually is doing. It's actually looking at the maximum singular value of x. For those who know what that means, but don't worry about that. Um, the only, and I guess I'll put the square here. This is not equal to that. So to make it equal, actually, you have to use a different norm, which is called the Frobenius norm. Just, it's just the guy that or a, I don't think he maybe invented that, but he uh, was a, a very famous guy when it came to matrix and linear, matrices and linear algebra. Um, and so you have to just put norm x. If you want this thing, if you want the sum of the squared elements, then you have to put this Frobenius squared. And then it does equal that. You can also write this also, by the way, equals um, sum, sum, x, uh, x dot squared, right? It's a little more compact to do that. Now, there's one very critical point I want to make here. And that is the result that you get out of doing this. You, solve, you write a optimization problem, you solve it. What you get out of this is a sequence of control actions. Right? You get u1 to t. That's just, and that is just what you do, the control actions you should take, given you start in this state here. You do not get a feedback controller of this form anymore. In fact, there does not exist a controller of this form that gives you this once you add constraints. Or I mean there isn't one guaranteed to be one that will give you this. So this is a big difference now between LQR and the optimization-based approach. In that, what you get out of LQR, you basically plug in one expression. You just give your A, B matrices and those costs. And you get back this K matrix that sort of tells you what to do no matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you are, you always follow that action. Here, it's a very different story. Here, you get some U's that only make sense when you start in that current point, right? 
you have to execute all of those, those use exactly in sequence. You don't look at what the actual state is anymore after that. You just execute those use and have that be that. Now, as you might imagine, this can be a problem if you, say, have a little bit of noise in your system and you get bumped off what exactly was what you thought would happen. So we'll come back to that next lecture, but this is sort of something to keep in mind is that although there is a lot of power here, the ultimate form of your control law is very different. You no longer get this nice closed form feedback controller that tells you what to do wherever you are. So we need something else a little bit different if we want to get back to a scenario like that. Okay, so let me just show you what this does in this, in this domain here. So here is our favorite generator task, and maybe I'll eventually stop doing this one. It's a very useful uh, illustration too, so I'll probably keep using it for a few more examples. Um, here's our generator task, uh, and you know, here is our starting locations here. And again, we very quickly converge to our desired angles for everything. Um, the same thing happens for the uh, angular velocities too, I should add. I'm just not showing those here. What I do want to show though is the actual control inputs that it picks to do this now. So this now is very different from what you saw before. What you saw before was very extreme control actions that it would take in order to achieve this zero cost here, or, or zero deviation from the desired state. Instead, what you get is this very interesting behavior where they actually quick, so, so, so you can sort of see what the bounds are very easily from this diagram, right? So say to take this generator three. The nominal power here is actually negative. That means there's a load on here too. So we have some load, but we also can generate some power. <clears throat> and so we're kept within some range around this nominal load. And the power that it produces, or that we actually have at that, at, at that node, never goes above or below this little band around that thing. Right? And same with all the others. This is actually highly non-obvious to me schedule of control inputs that you want to pick to get this nice behavior here, right? Um, I would not have been able to draw that up and say, okay, of course, just you know, synchronize them like this. Um, it's very non-obvious <clears throat> and it is optimal for this precise criterion that we specified, right? So it's, that, this, is, this is very cool because we've incorporated these hard constraints into our control task. We cannot pick controllers or control actions that are above and beyond, below a certain amount here. Um, this results in a highly non-obvious set of power inputs we should actually employ to get this kind of behavior here. But yet we're able to do that. And pretty quickly, we're able to you know, schedule these things however they want. They all eventually reach the nominal uh, control input here, and we reach our desired state. Now again, this becomes less nice if there's a little bit of noise in the system. Because now all we've been given is this sequence of controllers, right? Over 10 seconds, you know, I guess I had 10,000 different, slightly different control actions to take, right? Depending on exactly where we are, how, how finally we, we discretize. But if things don't evolve exactly according to our dynamics, then this could actually perform quite badly. We'll get to that shortly. But in the case where it doesn't, where things look good here, this looks very, very nice. Right? Because we're very quickly able to still get to our desired location here without ever worrying about our control action being something that's just completely unrealistic. Now here I don't put any constraints on, for example, changes in control. So you will see kind of big jumps here from the, the, you know, the, the lip. It's not, not, just, not just one time step there. It would actually look like uh, it's actually a little bit more gradual than that. But there certainly is a pretty quick uh, you know, swing from very high, you know, from, their, from their minimum possible control input to their maximum possible, possible control input. But the nice thing is here, you could just add the constraint that you have some uh, you know, ramp constraint on the power too. You could add that in here. And then it would figure out the thing to do with that. And, and that's even harder to do with LQR, right? Because then you sort of have LQR where, okay, I, I have some control input, maybe I'll just you know, clip it to both my allowable sort of rate of change. That can make things go horribly, horribly wrong sometimes. And so 
all these things can be accounted for by a framework like this where you just actually add those constraints as constraints in an optimization problem. And then make it work, can work very well in practice. Yeah? Right, yeah, so I'm not showing the ranges here, but, but for, for generator 3, for example, my, my constraints in the program were the control input u can't be too much above the nominal input, and it can't be more than 0.5 below the nominal input, right? And, and I'll just, I mean, I can just see it here. This is 0.5 above, and this is 0.5 below. So the red line can never go outside this range here, um, which is sort of, this is the, the midpoint in between these two extremes here. So we can never go outside this range here. Um, the LQR controller would actually want to go very, very small at first, and then go bigger, or something like that maybe. Um, but here we're simply saying, look, we're going to just say that you can never go outside that range. And if you have that constraint, then this exact step pattern ends up being the best thing to do. So for a while, go to your minimum, and then go back to, then go to your maximum. You're never outside your range, um, but you're doing the right thing. Why did it do this here? So what's happening is that in order to get these, um, essentially they start, the, the, the voltage angles of these generators, this, this one here, this is the red one here, it starts off too high. Okay, so it, it's ahead of where we want to be. Now the way to get a voltage angle to slow down is to generate less power than you need. That will cause the angle to, to drop. Now, the problem is that if you just did that, um, it would keep dropping, <laughs> right? So what you do is you sort of let it drop at first, then at the exact right time, you increase it again to sort of speed things up to get the... So, so, so what's happening is that your, your omega for this is evolving like this. Um, we need to have it drop a little bit to decrease the voltage angle. Then we have to get it to go back up, right, to sort of maintain its reference um, angular velocity in order to get this to be good. Uh, so what's happening here is omega, and in fact I can probably even show on a, on a past one what LQR is doing. So what LQR is doing here, and it does something similar but just not as drastic here, is that the voltage angle, the, the um, omega here will drop at first and then come back up. And the way to do that is you first hold back on the power a little bit and then you put a little bit more in than you would want to do normally. So that's what this little um, low and then high element there is doing. Now again, the point though is that I would never know how to specify that on my own. Right? I, I could never devise a control log by just looking at this problem that would actually have do this. Say so, okay, you know, hold your power for low for a second, then do two seconds at really high, and that's going to just put you right there. That would be of course impossible. Um, and so it's very nice of this optimization framework because you can just tell it what you want. I just want to get to this state here. And I can't violate these constraints here. And it just, everything else just kind of falls out from that. So, I think, I have a little more time, good. So, to summarize, um, and these are just a couple points that I, that I have here. Um, there are others as well. But, the overall take home from all of this in some sense should be that all these methods have different pros and cons. Right? We talked about three different ways of controlling systems, namely PID control or just PD control. You probably don't want to, don't want to use just P control because that, that has some problems. But um, PD control, PID control, LQR, and then this optimization based approach here. And the point is that they all have their benefits and their downsides. Right? So PID control, for example, it's very easy to implement. It's just literally you look where you want to be, look where you are, and multiply it by something, and, and then do that. So a lot of, for example, small microcontrollers that can't have very complex logic will use PID control, right? Because it's a very easy thing to do. It doesn't take much code at all. Very hard to screw it up, I guess, other than screwing up gains. You're not going to probably screw up your implementation of PID control. Um, it can also work without a model, right? So that integrator term we talked about before, even when we did not know how much power they all needed to do to produce, it actually kind of caught up to that anyway. Whereas the rest of these all depend very critically on this model of the system. 
LQR, I mean LQR to compute it, they all have different sensitivities in that if LQR, if the model's wrong, maybe it can still work okay. Uh, oscillation, if the model's wrong, it can actually work very poorly sometimes. Unless you have some stuff to talk about next time. Um, on the other hand, PD control, we have this issue of gain tuning, right? We have to tune these gains to, you know, do we oscillate too much, then tune one up a little bit? Do we not get fast enough, tune one down a little bit? Um, and that's one problem. It's kind of a pain to do. But there are, I, sh I should mention also, ways of kind of making this more formal, how you tune those gains. Um, but a bigger issue, in some sense, is that this actually does not always work. Um, I showed a case here where we have five generators and we have five knobs we can turn. This is sort of like in that old room example where we had four rooms you want to control the temperature of and you had four heaters. If you only had two heaters, remember what I said was you actually could uh, control some of them still. You actually could get them all in a big, into a, into a state, but something like PID control will actually not work at all there. You will need something like LQR, some sort of multivariable control, multivariable control method in order to actually achieve those results. So we didn't talk about that much, but um, just as, a, as an aside, PID will not always even work at all. In cases where you have more state variables than controls, this could be very, very hard to do, if not impossible. Um, LQR, on the other hand, can work in those situations. Um, it gives us nice feedback controller that, that, that specifies control as a function of all the states. And that actually would work, for example, in the room where you have two thermostats, uh, sorry, two heaters and four rooms, that actually would potentially give you a control law that could, that could get everything to its desired temperature, which is pretty impressive. It's also pretty easy to compute, right, because one line of MATLAB code, which had the DLQR, despite the fact that for us it's magic still, um, it's pretty, pretty nice that you can just compute that. Um, Unfortunately, as I said before, we can't incorporate the constraints into it, and so it might prescribe really insane actions to get those four rooms in the state that it wants. It might do something really crazy. This does not make any sense at all. It also requires a model of the system. I mean, so does this approach, certainly. Actually, actually this one is more dependent on the model, so this is a con of both these two methods. Um, but there is some work, for example, that if you don't know a model of a system, well, you can use machine learning to learn a model of the system. You have a bunch of examples you've seen of state, control, and next state. You can set up a machine learning task to actually learn a model from data like that. So, so there are ways around not having an a priori model of your system. And finally, optimization. Um, again, we can incorporate constraints now. It can do very complex things very, you know, with very little effort on our part. We just specify what we want to happen, the actual constraints we want to obey, and what falls out is a sequence of controllers, or, or sorry, not controllers, but control actions that actually achieve that. So that's pretty, pretty impressive. Um, on the cons, it is more time consuming. I mean that by, by, in terms of solving it, right? We have to solve a quadratic program or a linear program or something like that whenever we want to get control actions, um, as opposed to just plugging in our numbers multiplied by a matrix and getting out a result. That's uh, substantially more complex to solve a QP than to multiply a vector by a matrix. And also does not give any feedback controller like this, right? So if we have a new starting state we want to optimize from, we have to solve this all over again. Whereas LQR, no matter what state we're in, we just do this once, with that one column MATLAB and we have a controller forever. You know what to do no matter where we are. Okay, are there any questions here? I'm, I'm actually going to start, I don't, have, I don't have the slides posted yet, but I'll, I'll have them here and I'll post them shortly um, on our last unit here, which is on stochastic systems. But uh, first, are there, are there any questions about this? Any element of, these, uh, of this set of slides here? Okay. 
Moving on to the last thing. So maybe to motivate this, I actually, I actually don't have this right away in the, in the motivation here, but as I was saying before, this looks really great here, right? In that it's choosing some fairly complex set of control actions that get very nice behavior here and just sort of do it in a, in a way it would be very hard to, to know what to do intuitively um, if I didn't, wasn't able to solve this opposition problem. The problem though is that what I get out of this is again just a sequence of control inputs. So imagine I want to control the system for 10 seconds, right? And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to solve this opposition problem and then just execute those actions. One after the other. That's what it's saying to do here. Um, that's great, but if something goes off a little bit, right, if this is actually a little bit noisy of a system maybe, um, then all of a sudden the state the system thought you'd be in when it prescribed that action there is actually not the state it might actually be in. So this can no longer be the best thing to do. So if we just execute these control actions blindly, that could be really bad. Now, maybe LQR has less of a problem because what we have there is actually this gain that tells us what to do in any state. Maybe it's better, maybe it's not. Hard to say for sure. Um, but that motivates at least a little bit different considerations when we talk about thinking about systems where there is noise. So this brings us to our final set of slides for the course. There'll be some examples afterwards too. These actually aren't up yet either. Um, but let me just start going through these. So <clears throat> the last unit we'll talk about here is what to do when systems do in fact have noise. So remember this is kind of how we proceeded with dynamical systems. Where first we talked about deterministic ones. Then we talked about systems that have some stochasticity in them where things can actually evolve in a way you're not randomly in some, in some way. Now the question is, well, okay, that, that made sense for modeling things, but how do we actually go about controlling systems that have stochasticity? This could be a much, much harder problem than deterministic control. So again, basic question again, what if the system we're trying to control is stochastic? We have some dynamics here plus some noise term where looking back two slides ago to our set of slides on dynamical systems, epsilon here is some zero mean noise term. At least conceptually with any distribution we want. And remember, it's important to remember that, that stochasticity can arise either because the system might have some true actual noise, whatever that means. Um, you know, things could be really noisy physically. Um, we might just not model the system all that well, right? There are certain variables we just don't want to really care about. Um, and so we, you know, approximate the system as a simpler one, uh, but there are still some errors that we have that maybe in the true sense are deterministic, but which we'll just capture as being stochastic noise. For example, you probably don't want to model, you know, the, the exact, um, speed at which, for example, a, a gas turbine would, would put power on the system would depend on the, you know, the exact configuration maybe of the gas, the, the gas, the gas fluid in the turbine itself. Right? But we probably don't want to start modeling all that in our system. We'll just say that these things balance out. We'll just sort of get it right in average and we'll treat whatever we don't know about that as being kind of the noise. Right? Um, it can also involve, uh, stochasticity can come up from inaccurate predictions. So say for example that we're going to use in our, in our model, one of the states is going to be the, t the, the temperature outside. Right? And we have some maybe prediction of how this temperature evolves according to, for example, like a, the autoregressive models you guys are using in your, in your homework. Um, now this is sort of reasonable, right? That can kind of work okay, but we're not going to model temperature exactly using a model like that. And so inaccurate predictions of our state actually could correspond to needing stochasticity in our model.
And there's a couple questions now that arise when we talk about stochastic systems. Namely, we don't know what state we're going to end up in, right? For a given set, even for a fixed initial state and a fixed future state, sorry, <laughs> fixed set of controls, a fixed initial state and a fixed set of controls, we don't know what the future states we're actually going to be, right? Because there's noise in them, there's randomness. So how do we even define what cost means? I mean, before we define cost in terms of the cost of a state and of a control, how do we even go about doing that here? Now, I think the basic idea is that there's a lot of things we can do. When we have stochasticity, we have lots of possible notions of what cost really is. Kind of one of the most obvious ones, let's just look at expected cost of the system, right? So, we take the expectation of the states we're going to be in, given some sequence of controls, say, and look at what the expected value of those costs are. That'll be a number, too. And so that can also be our objective. We have to define some objective, so that's a good one. It's also kind of nice because expectations are linear. We can actually move this inside the sum, and that ends up being nice for all sorts of reasons here, the fact that we can do this. Um, it's not the only one. And, and in fact, we're going to use this one exclusively, pretty much, in the rest of this uh, lecture. But in the course, but I just want to mention that this is by no means the only possible cost function you could use for stochastic domains. A equally valid one <coughs> would be, for example, let's have the cost be the probability that the sum of costs exceeds some threshold C. Right. So this one, this expected value can kind of be bad because even though you know, it captures maybe the expected value of cost. Maybe we have a very, very bad scenario that's possible that would have very, very high cost, which is still somewhat likely under this as long as everything else has low cost, right? This, on the other hand, would say, look, we want to minimize the probability that our cost is above some threshold. So maybe if there's a whole region of the space where the cost is above a certain threshold, we would just say we cannot go there with a certain probability. Um, you can't sort of say, you could not, for example, guarantee that you never enter something in a lot of cases, right? Because a lot of cases, unless, I guess, I guess it depends what the, what the noise, noise distribution is. But for some distributions, if some states are possible, right, there's sort of always the possibility you might end up somewhere else. But we still might want to just minimize the probability to make us very small that we end up somewhere bad. Um, but as I said before, th th these are very good cost functions and objective functions. Um, there's a ton of research and sort of risk mitigation that talks about functions like this, but we're not going to address them. We're going to really think about the expected value cost function with the caveat in mind that this can lead to bad situations sometimes because we might get to a situation where, you know, the expected value is, looks pretty good still, but we still have a high probability of something bad happening every once in a while. So just to, just to finish now, and I'll think I'll, I'll end here, and then we can pick up next time. So let me see how much time we have. Yeah, I'll end here, we can pick up next time. So there's good news and bad news here. <laughs> and the bad news to start off with is that this problem, stochastic optimization, sometimes even in cases where it should not be that hard, right? Maybe the dynamics still are linear, and you, you still have a lot of complex things. Um, this can still be an extremely hard problem to solve optimally. Uh, once you introduce stochasticity and distributions that will change over time and it will, and, and, and it will sort of, you need to maintain completely over time to really understand the system fully. Uh, in the general case, there's nothing to do other than just enumerate the entire distribution over all possible states you could be in at every single time. You have to just do that. Um, and that's, a, as you can imagine, a very, very hard thing to specify. Right? You have an infinite dimensional distribution at every time you need to maintain. So that's kind of the bad news. These are very hard to solve in general. The good news is that 
there are a lot of very good heuristics and certain special cases can be solved exactly. In particular, the LQR setting, so linear quadratic control, with Gaussian noise, so no constraints, but quadratic costs, linear dynamics, that actually is solvable exactly. It's kind of surprising, actually. You can actually solve this optimally, despite the fact that there is noise in the problem. Also, another situation that we can solve exactly, though, again, these are typically thought of in terms of discrete states and discrete actions, are Markov decision processes, which I think many of you have, have heard of and have mentioned. Um, so this is a sort of small scale setting, typically, because we typically cannot, I mean, in general, it's a fully general setting, but we typically can only solve it for cases where we have relatively small numbers, of a small finite number of states, and a finite number of controls. And finally, even though it is suboptimal, this technique known as model predictive control, or MPC, which we'll talk about a lot in the rest of the course, well, I guess as much as we can talk about it in the time we have left, um, this works really, really well. So MPC is the return to this optimization approach, right, where you solve optimization problems to find controls, the problem, though, was that if you just execute those actions blindly, things are going to, you know, bad things will happen. What MPC does is it actually solves these optimization problems at every time point. So you resolve it every time to figure out what's the best thing to do given the current state. This is not the optimal strategy. It is not giving you a strictly optimal solution, but it works extremely well in practice. Um, and really offers us a way to use this paradigm of controls optimization even in stochastic settings. Because that's very, very powerful. So with the last couple lectures, we'll talk about that and I'll give a lot of examples. Um, hopefully I'll also get to a lecture on talking about kind of current directions of research in these, in these areas, using all of these techniques as, as the starting point for a lot of these, these problems. So I'll see you next time.